<laughs> Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Good. I'm blessed to see some pastors in the house as well. I'm Pastor Cho and his precious family, thank you for being here. And where's Pastor Norland? He's at the back there. Bless you and thank you for being here as well. Sure appreciate these men of God. Um, you should have, as part of your outline, you should have something called the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to deal with that this week. If you weren't here last week, we dealt with the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, you can pick up a copy of that on your way out as well. Otherwise, I encourage you to go online and listen to the messages because I believe they are extremely important. Let me start by saying that there is a war in the heavenlies going on at present. We see it manifest in the natural. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't think there's ever been a time such as this in our nation and in fact the world. It seems that all the norms of society are eroding. Firstly, think about the USA. The politics of this country has got so toxic and partisan. And those who are elected actually do not serve us, but serve themselves. The cameras have become their constituency. The United States, as someone wrote last week, is a civil war of discourse. A civil war of, con uh, of, of conduct. And if you're a conservative, and I'm not talking about being a, affiliated to any political party, but if you're a conservative, then hate speech today is defined as anything that is contra to someone else's point of view. I mean, just think about it. Just last weekend at the annual Harvard and Yale football game, it was disrupted for over an hour by some people who wanted to protest uh, climate change. And there's a, a crumbling confidence in the country's democratic institutions. And it has paralyzed the federal government. These global trends, or these trends in this uh, country, you can see it across the globe. Challenging governance and changing the nature of power will drive, will have major consequences over the next few years. There's a rise in, in tensions in all regions and all types of government. And these conditions will contribute to the expanding threat of terrorism and social unrest. If you just look at the countries, what's happening in Colombia and Venezuela and Brazil and Iraq and Iran and Hong Kong and many other countries. And then there's China. China faces a daunting test with its political stability and balance. After three years of historic economic growth and social change, Beijing is now faced with a tremendous slowing down of the economy and the sanctions are really biting. The new emperor, uh, President Xi Jinping's consolidated power and he is going to be the emperor or the president for life and that's just upset the whole uh, status quo, the established system of stable succession. And there's a restless population in China just not the Uyghurs and what's going on in Hong Kong, but the rural peasants as well. They say that there's over 180,000 uh, rural or local riots every single year in China. The only thing that it hasn't become a national event, these riots, is because they are localized based on things that are happening in the local communities. And uh, Xi Jinping is using this internal strife to try and unite the nation by pointing to an external enemy. That's the United States of America. The Chinese pop, uh, authorities are now employing AI, artificial intelligence, to control populations. And the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists reported on the 25th of November that leaked documents reveal that Chinese police, and I quote, are guided by a massive data collection and data analysis that uses artificial intelligence to select entire categories of residents for detention. If you think about it, uh, they now have facial recognition in China and within eight minutes, eight minutes, they can find anybody in that country. Population of 1.6 billion. And China's leadership believe that AI uh, is in the forefront 
for the global war that might come and also for economic protection. And that's a direct quote from intelligence sources. I illustrate all of this to just say that the, the world is in turmoil. And never before, never before in the history of the world do we need Jesus like we need now. Amen? And But we as the people of God need to be aware of what's going on in the world. We can't bury our heads in the sand. And then we look. We look at the church in the West today. It's in crisis. It's in free fall, including the United States. And then what has happened is that the power of the church has moved from the global north to the global south, from the global west to the global east. In the USA, the number of nuns, those, N-O-N-E-S, those who claim no religious affiliation is growing in unprecedented numbers. The center of Christianity, as I said, has, gone, has shifted from the north to the south and from the west to the east. Today, the Christian community in Latin America and Africa accounts for over one billion people. And then they are experiencing unprecedented growth in the south and the east. The global religious wild card is China. Even today, demographers estimate that more Christian believers are found worshiping in China on any given Sunday than the United States. Upward of 225 million people are worshiping in small groups now because the church is being persecuted in, in China. And so what accounts for this? I believe it is one thing, it's one thing alone that you and I have been talking about. It is the Holy Spirit. They've embraced the power and the move of the Holy Spirit, which the church in the West has opted out. Today, the church in the West, they want to show, they want to lecture, they, they are a celebrity-driven model, and the Holy Spirit has been sidelined. You see, the church in the United States is losing ground because we look through at Scripture through a Western logical viewpoint. Ultimately, in the West, it is about the mind. You can go on the Internet. You can find all kinds of teachings that you want to. But you know what? If it's not Holy Spirit empowered, if it's not Holy Spirit driven, then it's just a lecture. Amen. Churches in the West have abandoned the Holy Spirit. No wonder we are losing people hand over first. And what's the difference? One thing and one thing alone between the north and the south and the west and the east is the Holy Spirit. It's a reliance on those nation, in those nations on the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a reliance on them manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. And yes, sometimes, folks, it is messy. And yes, there are charlatans out there claiming to possess powers that they do not have. But do we disregard and ignore anything and everything to do with the Holy Spirit because of some people out there? And I would say no. We can't if we want to see the church and especially the church grow and reach out, this church grow and reach our city for Jesus. We cannot ignore the Holy Spirit. I love that when Earl invited us to speak out a word today as he began to sing that one song, somebody shouted out revival. Without revival, we do not have a church tomorrow. Amen. How can we ignore the third part of the Godhead? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How can we ignore most of the New Testament when we, if we relegate or ignore the Scriptures that refer to the Holy Spirit? You see, either the whole Bible is true or none of it is true. We cannot pick and choose like we want. Either the whole Bible is applicable today or it is to be put away and we're left to our own devices. I remember years ago, Pastor Jack Hayford, we were in China one time teaching the leaders there and he said this. This must have been eight years ago. He said this and please listen to what he said. He said, don't look to the West. Don't look to the church in the United States because we are a bankrupt church. Listen to God and follow the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 from verse 20 to 23, Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. You see, we can't come to know God through the wisdom of the world. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 13 and 14, it says, And this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths by the, in spiritual words. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Without the Spirit of God, we cannot understand the words of God. You see, it has got to be understood by the Spirit of man. In 1 Corinthians 2 and 11, For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And where does the Spirit of God reside? The Spirit of God resides in you and me today. Amen? And so, the, no one knows the things of God. No one knows what's going on in the world out there unless it's the Spirit of God. What, no one knows what these words contain unless it's the Word of God that reveals it to us. Job 32 and 8, but there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. So we have to get back, folks, to ministering about and on the Holy Spirit, and so people's spirit man will grow. And that's going to be the theme for next year, how we grow the spirit man. We've grown the intellectual man. But we need to grow the spirit man. We need to come alive to God. I felt God was directing me to say that to you this morning because I've been praying about what we're going to be doing. We had a theme, people, place, and power last year. But this coming year, it's going to be about the spirit man, us growing the spirit man inside of us, us becoming alive to what God has in store for us because I believe revival is coming to this church. Amen. Romans 8, 14, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Feeding your spirit man, enabling your faith and anointing, lift you to a place where God can use you to touch the world in which we live. And so that's the backdrop of the message. And I've only got 20 minutes left. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What if Christ came to Seattle? What would he do? What would he say? Would he even be listened to? Next question is, does Jesus live in Bellevue Church? And those are questions that are back door to the scripture this morning out of Galatians chapter 5. And these verses are foundational to our Christian lives. Chapter 5 and verse 16, we'll read all the way down to, to verse 25. It begins and ends with a commandment to walk in the Spirit. Isn't it interesting that he begins this whole section and he says in verse 16 and he says in verse 25, walk in the Spirit. And he says, I say, walk in the Spirit, verse 16, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if, notice the word, but if, you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities or hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, 
disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and such things of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. For those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. For if we, and here's the second bracket, for if we live by, by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So, the, com the command for us is to yield control of our lives to the Holy Spirit. The command is followed by recognition. Walk by the Spirit is followed by the recognition of the conflict. The flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. And the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So that you may not do as you please. There's a conflict that goes on in each one of our lives. A conflict between righteousness and sinfulness. When, we are, when the flesh is in control, we get what we see in uh, verses 19 to 21. And these are the deeds of the flesh. And I'm not going to repeat them. It's immorality, impurity, and so on. It's not an exhaustive list, though, folks. It says at the end of that list, it says, and things like these. In other words, he's saying, and etc. They're deeds of the flesh that he's not mentioned that we need to be warned against. Now, even although these are behaviors for non-believers, unfortunately, until we are glorified, we too struggle against those very things as well. But he says to us that we need to walk in the Spirit. Now look at the contrast. Verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things is no law. Now, with a believer you might see some sin on an occasion. But as you draw closer to God, as you draw closer to Christ, as you allow the Spirit of God to take over your life, as you commit yourself every single day on your knees before you, just as you get out of bed, as you commit your life to Christ each day and say, Lord, I want to walk by, your, by the Spirit of God that's living inside of me, less and less of those things of the flesh will overtake you. Now, of course, the Bible also says that if any man says that he doesn't sin, he's a liar. But that, that process of sanctification is a decreasing frequency of the list in verses 19 to 21 and an increasing frequency of the list in 22 and 23. The term sanctification is used in the, that is used in the New Testament is hagimos, which basically means set apart. So listen to me, folks. Listen to me this morning. You are set apart. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit came and renewed your spirit. And you have been set apart to live a different kind of a life. Is it easy? No. Are you going to be challenged? Yes. Are you going to be tempted? Absolutely. Because if the enemy can get you to slip up, if it can get you to stumble, if it can get you to sin, then guess what? That record player of your stumbling, of your falling, every now and again he's going to hit that button and you're going to say, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. Amen? But God's called us to live differently. So to summarize, life in the flesh under the law produces the vices of verses 19 to 21. Life lived in the Spirit produces the virtues of verse 22 and 23. You see, walking by the Spirit restrains the flesh. So it is the Spirit who stops us from doing the things we please. And when you walk in the Spirit, there is a restraint. Walking in the Spirit produces the fruit 
as listed in verses 22 and 23. Because, you see, that fruit that I'm talking about is the essential mark of a Christian. How come we are so often criticized by the world? Because the world does not see the fruit of the Spirit living in our lives, of the Spirit manifest in our lives. So let me unpack this quickly. Now, it's obvious that everyone doesn't engage in all the deeds of the flesh at the same time. And you pick and choose them at will. But the fruit of the Spirit is singular. It's a package deal. You don't say, well, today I'm going to show some joy. And tomorrow, well, maybe it'll be gentleness. And a couple of days after that, I'm going to try and love somebody. You do that with sin. You could say, well, today I'm going to be impure. And then I'm going to go to a wild party. And on and on and on. At the end of verse 23, it says, Against such things, in other words, things like these, we mustn't do, he's saying. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is not intended to be a list of things that you sort of work through and you choose. The nine virtues that are listed in Galatians are like a, a bouquet of beautiful flowers that will be evidenced by anybody around us. And we will see them together. Now, being fruitful is also spoken of in the Old Testament. And I really don't have time to read those, many of those scriptures, but I'm just going to remark on one or two of them. Hosea chapter uh, 14 and verse 8. He says, from me comes your fruit. Psalm 1 Verse 1 to 3. How blessed is a man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And then he goes on, and yeah, that's what I want you to hear. He will be like a tree planted firmly by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Spiritual fruit is a product of a righteous life. Matthew 13, it talks about... Uh, the Word of God is like a seed that is planted. And when it finds good soil, listen to this. When it finds good soil, I believe that here in this house today, there is good soil. It goes on and it says, when, when it finds good soil, it brings forth fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. In other words, he's saying, that when he finds, the Word of God finds root in yours and my life, it'll bring forth spiritual virtue. It'll bring forth spiritual results. Colossians 1 and 10 says, Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. And John 15 and 12, Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so it may bear more fruit. Sometimes we go through those periods. We're walking completely in the Lord, with the Lord. There, but sometimes it feels like it's just, like he's, he's pruning you. But what do you do with a, with, a, with a tree to produce the bigger and the better fruit? We've got to prune it in season, don't we? We've got to prune it before it begins to blossom, before it bears fruit. Because if you don't, it just becomes a gnarly old tree that produces fruit this big. But when you prune it properly, when you prune that vine properly, you get those wonderful big fruit. And God does that with you and I. You see, He does that. Why? Because He wants us to produce more fruit than we're producing right now. And sometimes it feels like, well, he's hitting on me. God's hitting on me. No, he's pruning you. Because there's things in your life that you'd again to get rid of. There's things that he's saying, that is okay when you were a baby Christian, when you were over here. That's okay. But now that you're over here, now that you are seeking more of me, now that you want more of me in your life, you've got to lay aside those things. You've got to let him prune those things away. Amen? 
You see, the closer you get to God, the more you desire Him, the closer you get to God, the narrower the way. Come on, Peter, you're preaching good this morning. But seriously, folks, the more you want of God, the narrower the way becomes. Those things were okay once upon a time when you were a baby Christian. But now, He wants you to prune those away because there's something more in store for you. Amen? Hallelujah. John 15, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it so it may produce more fruit. And as he say, what does he say about the fruit that we're going to produce? Some 30, some 60, and some 100. We're to walk in a manner to bear fruit and put that fruit on display. And that's the proof that we are the disciples of Christ. And uh, let me just move on. Listen to the words of our Lord in Matthew uh, 7, 17. Every good produ tree produces good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John 15 says, And you shall know them by their fruits. Now, let me give you a further word. You can't love without an act of love. You can't have joy without expression of joy. It's the same with everything. And all of these are basically empowering us. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do this collectively. You see, if you're walking by the Spirit, the whole bouquet is evident to all. And so, finally, since we live by the Spirit, verse 25 of Galatians 5, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That keep in step is a military term. It describes a soldier standing in the ranks. To his left, to his right, in his front, and to the back are hosts of other soldiers. And when the commanding officer says, move out, they move out in step. And that's a wonderful image of the Christian life. We're not called to understand all that the captain of our salvation has in store for us. Our only duty is to get out of bed in the morning, fall on our knees and say, we're reporting for duty. Some days it's going to be light marching through green meadows under blue skies with plenty of stops for water and rest. Other days we might, like today, march under cloudy skies through deep valleys with hardly a moment of rest. And then sometimes we'll be called to come to venture out into the darkness where we must trust the Lord to bring us safely home again. Day by day, step by step, we're always listening and watching and looking to see where the Lord is leading us. One day, speaking to a man, he said this. He says, that man over there has been in the army. And I said, how do you know? He said, well... I know the soldier by his walk. See, the world needs to know us as soldiers by our walk. And then keep your hearts right for one another. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Galatians 5, verse 26. We cannot fall into a comparison game, folks. You know, if God's using somebody today to minister to someone else, we must never be critical. We must never point a finger at them. Amen. And as we come to the end of the message, I, I'm struck with this, this fact that the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is available to all of us. And you and I, we sometimes will have to make that choice a hundred times a day. You're sitting at the office and there's somebody who comes in there and this person is like, he's just under your skin. He's there. And every time he comes near you, it kind of, there's this thing in you that just twists. You have a choice. 
you have a choice to display the fruit of the Spirit or you can allow those, those sins that they talk about in 19 onwards to get to you. You see, you're the only Bible some people will ever read. You're the only Jesus that some people will ever know. And so, does Jesus live where you live? The truth of the answer is, it depends on you. I'm going to read you a story from uh, Tony Campolo. I love this story. He was walking down a busy Philadelphia street at noontime and saw what he referred to as a bum coming down the street. This bum had a huge beard with rotted food in it. And though it was August, he was wearing a long overcoat and mumbling to himself, drinking, drinking a cup of McDonald's coffee. Suddenly, this dirty, smelly bum stopped Tony and said, Hey, mister, don't you want some of my coffee? And Tony Campolo said, That's very kind, but no thank you. And he started on his way. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit moved him, and he went back and says, Yes, I will have some of your coffee. He took a sip, and he said, You're being awfully generous this morning with your coffee. And the man said, well, the coffee was especially good this morning, and when God gives you something good, you ought to share it. Then Campolo said, well, is there anything I could give you? And he figured that this guy was going to hit him up for, for five bucks or so, and he said, and the man said, no. He said, you can give me a hug. Campolo said he was hoping for the five dollars, rather. <laughs> and he reached over and hugged this bum, who held on to him for what seemed forever. And Campolo said, as I stood there on that busy Philadelphia street, hugging this bum, I heard a voice coming down the corridors of time saying, inasmuch as you've done to one of these, you've done this to me. And suddenly I realized I was not holding a bum in my arms, but I was holding Jesus. And I have a little photograph that we can put up there. Yesterday, I'm not going to mention their names because they would embarrass. But yesterday, a young mother and a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old son packed up about over 30 uh, packages like this, and the little boy drew drawings on each one of those packages and then they went on downtown and in those packages were sandwiches and gloves and uh, socks and stuff like that and they went downtown just the two of them and the little guy and they went and gave out each one of those packages and she told me she said not every one of those that they gave a package to was kind but over 90% of them smiled when this little boy came up and gave this package. And all of them who accepted that package willingly said to them, we're going to pray for you. Isn't that amazing? And they engaged in conversation with some of them. Some of them, in fact, one guy said, told them about a burger place that they need to go to because that's the best place to get burgers in town. Others spoke about school. Others inquired about this little boy. But you know what? That's the spirit of Christmas. Amen? That's the fruit of the spirit of God demonstrated. No big fanfare, nothing. Just a mother and a little boy that were so moved by the Spirit of God to go and manifest the fruit of the Spirit in the season in which we are right now. Oh, would you come? Amen? Amen. Well, did we learn something this morning? Hallelujah. <laughs> Let me pray. Let me pray right now, and then Earl's going to lead us. Again, Lord, we thank you for our time this morning. We thank you that it is helpful, that it's practical, that it's convicting. Thank you for giving us your word. And more importantly, thank you for giving us your spirit. Otherwise, your word would be meaningless to us. 
Lord, we cannot understand your word without the Spirit interpreting it for us. So we thank you for your word and your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, as I was praying last night and early this morning, I was up at about four, just and that's not important. It's neither here nor there. But I just felt the Lord wanted me to speak to some of you this morning. Some of you, yeah, this morning, you feel you're inadequate. There's a sense of unworthiness. But, and the Lord's saying to you this morning, get out of your little boat Get out of your little boat of religion and walk on the water. There's so much more for you than where you're living right now. There's more freedom for you than what you're living right now. And so my challenge to you is as we begin to worship, if you'd like prayer, to just come and stand here in the front. You don't have to live under that spirit of inadequacy. You don't have to live under that bondage of where the enemy says that because you did that, that, and that, whenever it was, whether it was yesterday or a year ago or five years ago, you don't have to live under that spirit of bondage. You can be free today in Jesus' name.